Good afternoon and good evening. Wherever you are in the world, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative to this webinar titled Climate Change in the Deep Ocean. Why does it matter? My name is Michelle Gurayev. I studied marine science and geography at the University of Sydney, and I am speaking to you from Mexico City. Currently, I am a member of the DOSI Climate Change Working Group, which is hosting this webinar today. First, I would like to introduce the DOSI uh, initiative, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, known as DOSI. DOSI is a scientific network which operates across disciplines and borders to advise on the sustainable use and management of the deep ocean. DOSI has multiple working groups that address many different deep sea topics, including fisheries, deep sea bed mining, pollution, and others. If you want to learn more about DOSI, we will post a link to their webpage so that you can learn more about it. This link will be in the chat if you want to look at it. The climate change working group within DOSI is particularly interested in understanding and promoting public and scientific awareness about the, the role of the deep sea in the climate system and about the vulnerability of deep sea ecosystems to climate change, and also about how this affects human society. The Climate Change Working Group has 140 members across 33 different countries, and our goal is to inform policymakers to better manage deep sea ecosystems in the face of the many threats they are exposed to. We also educate scientists about the importance of their work, information of policy and management. Today, we have a great array of speakers for you coming up during this webinar, all experts in climate change and the deep sea. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Laurent Bob. Dr. Laurent is a senior scientist at the French National Center for Scientific Research within the Institut Pierre-Simon Laplace. He also directs the Geosciences Department at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, France. Dr. Bob obtained his PhD from Université Pierre et Marie Curie in Paris. His research interests include ocean carbon climate interactions, ocean acidification and deoxygenation, and climate change impacts on marine ecosystems. Welcome, Dr. Laurent. Thank you very much, Michel. I'm very happy to be with you today, speaking from Paris. Uh, and I will start sharing my screen. And please tell me when you see my slides. Is it OK? Yes, Laurent, it's good. OK, so I'll be talking about uh, the changes in the deep ocean, and particularly changes due to anthropogenic climate change. Um, so no worries, I'll be talking about the deep ocean, but I will start with the, the surface ocean, because that's where basically most long-term documented changes are found and are observed since many decades. And what you see on that slide are two of the major modifications of the ocean due to anthropogenic climate change. The first one is, of course, warming of the ocean. And you see that the surface of the ocean has warmed by almost one degree since the start of the 20th century. That's what you have here on the, on the upper uh, left panel, uh, with many implications for uh, marine ecosystems at the surface of the ocean. And, and there have been lots of studies in the past years on the impacts of marine heat waves on uh, coastal ecosystems, coral reefs, kelp forests, etc., etc. In addition to global warming, one of the other threats uh, to marine ecosystems is what we call ocean acidification. That's linked to the fact that the ocean is absorbing a large part of our carbon uh, anthropogenic emissions. And because CO2 is a weak acid, uh, the impact of this absorption of CO2 in the ocean is, is acidification. And what you have here on the bottom left is uh, some uh, time series of surface pH documenting the decrease of surface pH uh, which we name ocean acidification. So that's the case for observations, but also when analyzing climate projections for the next decades, most of these analyses focus on the surface ocean. And what we know for the ocean in the coming decades is uh, the fact that it will warm more depending on the scenarios. That's what you have here on the upper left. The surface ocean will be more acidified. Uh, that's what you have here on the upper right. Uh, but we also know that the ocean will be less oxygenated. Uh, that's what we call ocean deoxygenation. And last but not least, 
climate projections also indicate that the ocean may be less productive. So less production by phytoplankton with implications for the entire food webs in the ocean. So this is mostly what we know about the surface of the ocean. Uh, but the deep ocean is not spared from those climate related changes. Uh, so as I explained, the ocean absorbs uh, a large part of our carbon emissions. It also absorbs a large part of the additional heats that we find in the climate system because of increasing greenhouse gases. And these additional heats and this additional carbon don't stay just in the surface ocean. They are transferred to the deep ocean with implications and consequences for the physics, chemistry, and biology of the deep ocean. So we've been using the same climate projections uh, to look at the deep ocean. And what you have here are three maps uh, indicating uh, the temperature changes, the pH changes, and the oxygen concentration changes in the benthic ocean, as deep as a few thousands of meters. And what you see here is that at the end of the century, we have strong signals reaching the deep ocean, a warming signal, an acidification signal, and a deoxygenation signal. So clearly, the deep ocean is not spared from those climate-related changes. So let me come back maybe to three characteristics of the deep ocean uh, that make that uh, deep ocean very sensitive, very vulnerable to climate-related changes. Uh, the first characteristic is the fact that many deep regions are well connected to the ocean surface. And this is because of the transport of surface water matters, matters to, to the deep ocean. This is the case, for example, in the North Atlantic, where model projections have shown that these acidified waters formed at the surface sink to the bottom of the ocean and bring these acidified waters very, very deep. And some publications have shown that many of the deep sea canyons, many of the seamounts in the North Atlantic would be impacted by low uh, pH waters in the coming decades. And we know that those deep sea canyons, those seamounts, they host uh, quite a large biodiversity. So what I describe here for the North Atlantic, North Atlantic is kind of similar for the Southern Ocean, which is also very connected between deep and, and the surface ocean. And we find similar trends for temperature and oxygen changes. The second characteristic I'd like to quickly describe is the fact that even very moderate changes in the deep ocean would have significant consequences for deep life because they affect a particularly stable environment. So the deep ocean is much more stable than the surface ocean. Uh, and this is well illustrated by the use of climate velocity. So climate velocity is a metric that describes the rate a species would have to shift its range to maintain constant temperature. And we can use the same climate projections to look at climate velocities at the surface of the ocean on the left here and in the deeper ocean here between 200 and 1000 meter depths. And what you see here for the second half of the century is that this metric, which seems to be very important for life and for organisms that can migrate uh, in the ocean, this metric is much more uh, severely affected in the deep ocean than in the surface ocean. And that's because the deep ocean is much more stable. And so just a moderate change would have huge consequences for life. Last but not least, uh, in addition to these warming signal or these acidifi acidification signals that we find or that we will find in the deep ocean, uh, there is another big threat due to climate change for deep marine ecosystems. And this is linked to the fact that we expect a large reduction in the input of food from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. So most of the food available for deep organisms comes from the surface of the ocean in the form of particles of organic matter that sink down the water column. We expect with climate change, the ocean to be less productive. So to have less formation of these particles at the surface ocean, so less sinking of these particles to the deeper ocean. And that's well illustrated here on the bottom right. Uh, you see the change in this flux of organic matter to the sea floor. And in many ocean basins, in many ocean regions, we expect this flux of food to the, to the, to the deep sea floor to decline by up to minus 40 to minus 55% by the end of the century. So this would have large consequences on deep seafloor ecosystems. So if I summarize uh, those major changes that we expect for the deep ocean, 
And those three main characteristics that make the deep ocean very vulnerable to climate change, the fact that many deep regions are well connected to the ocean surface, and that's because of the physics of the ocean, because of the transport of surface water masses that are warmer, more acidified to depths. The fact that in the deep ocean, we have usually very stable uh, conditions. And so even moderate changes would have significant consequences for deep life. And last but not least, the fact that we expect large reductions in the input of food for deep ecosystems. So climate change and the deep ocean, we have to uh, expect warming, acidification, and less oxygenation, also less food. Lots of questions about the consequence for life in the deep. And this will be, I guess, discussed by the next panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laurent, for that wonderful presentation. I would just like to remind all the attendees to please send your questions via the Q&A box and just keep the chat for introducing yourself. Now I would like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Yoshihisa Shirayama. Dr. Yoshihisa is Professor Emeritus at Kyoto University, where he also received his Doctor of Science degree from the Graduate School of Science. He is the former Executive Director of the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science Technology, and his research interests include ecology and taxonomy of mayobenthos, especially in the deep sea, ocean acidification and environmental impact assessment of human activities on deep sea ecosystems. Welcome, Dr. Yoshihisa. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar here. Uh, so let me start my presentation. So the previous speaker uh, introduced how the environment will change in the deep sea. And because I am a deep sea ecologist, I'd like to uh, discuss about what the consequence for the deep sea ecosystems uh, due to the change of these uh, environmental changes. Uh, just an introduction, but what the characteristics of deep sea ecosystem is that it is defined more than 200 meters water depth. And because the water, seawater will absorb the sunlight, so the environment is dark as well as cold. And because it is dark, no plant can grow. And the deep sea ecosystem have to find someone who will make a food for the animals living there. And in most cases, the shallow water phytoplankton is the producer of the food. And they are sinking into the deep sea and become a food for the animals living there. And sometimes, uh, in a very special places, an autotrophic bacteria is growing in the deep sea, and they can be also in a food for a specific group of animals, uh, which adapted to that area where hydrogen sulfide is very rich, and also the it is toxic, but they uh, they are rather adapted to live in these environment. So, uh, which means the deep sea is an uh, area where the food is very limited. And therefore, the animals living in these areas uh, have an, a very good ability to find the food, which was sinking from the surface to the deep ocean. And they will swimming or moving to these areas and consume the food that drop to the deep sea environment very instantly. They have, they are always starving. And <clears throat> as the Lauren uh, introduced us that in the future, the surface ocean have less productivities so the deep sea ecosystem will be probably suffered by the less food supply to the deep sea floors. Also, uh, Lauren just introduced that the 
CO2 will become acidic in the, in the uh, future because the aragonite saturation depths in the deep sea is very, very, uh, say, critical. So if the pH decreases, the animals which is making a shell will be suffer seriously, especially in the deep sea. And also the water, we have uh, less oxygen, which means the areas where the ex there is an oxygen minimum zone in the deep sea. So if that hit or the widths of these zones will increases, the areas where these depths across will be suffered by a very low um, or limited uh, oxygen availabilities. So in these three issues are very serious uh, in the future for the uh, potential impact to the deep sea ecosystems. But in addition to that, uh, as Laura introduced, uh, the temperature of the deep sea probably will increase uh, up to 0.2 degrees Celsius or 0.4 degrees Celsius. And that change probably will be also a very important impact to the deep sea species. I'd like to introduce uh, some of the result of the observation, which was held in the deep sea uh, near central Japan. The animals living uh, in the Sagami Bay cold seep areas where the deep sea animals are living based on the growth of the autotrophic bacteria, that species are very well aggregated in these areas. And <clears throat> these species, uh, we have carried out a uh, continuous observation and found uh, sometimes they have, uh, say, simultaneous uh, spawning. The first, the male uh, individuals spawn the sperms, and then the egg spawning will follow. The in interesting thing is it happens uh, simultaneously throughout the population. And because it is very important to do that uh, due to the success of the fertilization of the sperm and eggs in the deep sea areas. And we have followed the change of the temperature before and after the spawning of the, these bivalves and found the key or cue for the spawning is the change of temperature of about 0.2 to 0.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, in this case, it's only 0.1 or uh, well, less than 0.1 degrees Celsius. That will lead to the hu huge mass spawning of the deep sea animals. So if the water temperature de increases in the deep sea, maybe there will be some impact on them. There are many scenarios what happens, but we don't know uh, exactly what will happen. But at least uh, there is a risk that reproduction of deep sea species will be impacted by the slight change of water temperature in the deep, deep sea. In addition, there is a lot of the imp additional impact associated with the uh, plastics, so we have to be very careful uh, for keeping the environment of the deep sea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoshihisa. Wonderful presentation. I'd like to introduce our next speaker now, Dr. Anna Kulasu. Dr. Anna is a researcher at Okeanos Institute of Marine Research within the University of Azores in Portugal. She did her PhD in ecology and biosystematics at the University in, of Lisbon in 2001. And she has participated in several projects concerning the deep sea hydrothermal vents, 
from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Her interests include the ecology of deep sea hydrothermal vents and other vulnerable marine ecosystems, understanding human impacts on deep sea ecosystems, and the importance of bringing science to policy. Welcome, Dr. Anna. Thank you. Good day to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to talk about how climate affects deep sea ecosystem services. And uh, this is a cartoon from the 80s where um, uh, it reflects the society. This is a group of ladies that they don't care about the bottom of the ocean and they don't know why. And I think that they don't care because they don't know it and they don't know the importance of it. So I'm trying to convince you how important the deep sea is and how the climate is changing the deep sea and its effects. So the deep sea, it's everything that Anna, you know. Sorry? Nobody can see your slides. Oh, sorry. Mm -mm. Okay, let me try again. Are you sorry? Can you see now? Yes. Sorry, shall I start over? Okay, this is the cartoon that I was talking about. The, um, the importance that society does not know what's happening on the deep sea, so that's why they don't care. And here, we can see a scheme of the deep sea. The deep sea is everything that it's below 200 meters and everything that is this dark blue and occupies 70% of the earth and 90% of this, more than 90% of the habitable volume. And the deep sea plays a key role in regulating the earth's climate by absorbing the excess of heat and the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But to a certain point after that, it starts feeling the effects of uh, too much um, heat and too much uh, uh, climate stressors. And the deep sea is like the landscape. It has several seascapes with mountains, valleys, plains, and all of these um, places have different species that play different roles and different functions. We have the marvelous organisms from the water column, like um, jellyfishes, squids, and other fishes that some of them are bioluminescent. On the bottom of the ocean, we have these zonal marine ecosystems like the sponge grounds and the coral reefs and other fishes that generally they have, they grow very slow, they live long and they have a poor uh, offspring. And all of them, they represent really uh, important uh, um, organisms on the deep sea. And um, the deep sea provides several ecosystem services. The ones that we can immediately see are the provisioning services, the fishes and the shellfish, the energies in form of oil, gas, minerals, other chemicals and pharmaceutical compounds. If you think about the COVID test, the RT-PCR is based on an enzyme from a bacteria from the deep sea. We have the regulating services like the climate regulation, the carbon sequestration, waste absorption and detoxification, and cultural services like tourism, education, aesthetic recreation, but all of that is possible because of the supporting services. These are really important, providing habitat, um, the recycling of nutrients, the primary and secondary production, production, the water circulation and exchange. So the importance of the deep sea, because it provides us materials like food, energy, raw materials, uh, like minerals, metals, and um, natural products, genes, chemicals, and materials, some sponges, for instance, are inspiring new materials for medicine. Also, it helps the planet to function. It's really important to regulate the climate, to regenerate the nutrients, to absorb the waste and detoxify, to sequester and absorb the carbon, and also fulfill some societal needs of education, scientific and recreation. And as Laura showed, the climate velocity in the global ocean if you see the three uh, uh, bottom lines, it's the deep sea. And you can see that the climate velocity is quite high. The changes are quite high uh, uh, on the different projections of climate. So we also know that the melting of the polar ice is weakening ocean currents. So weakening these currents is also affecting the supporting services, the nutrient cycling, the habitat provision, the biological pump, 
the primary and secondary production. There are some studies that already show that marine species are moving deeper and towers the pole to escape to the rising temperatures. And um, studies looking to the change of biomass in the future by modeling um, how the biomass will decrease under different climate scenarios show that there will be a decrease of biomass in any of them. And it will be the higher trophic levels that will be the most affected. And these higher trophic levels are tuna fishes, sharks, birds, and all the other large animals that some of them we are using as provisioning services too. And uh, according to FAO, commercial exploited fishes and shellfish from the deep sea ecosystems will be also exposed to these climate risks. And this uh, climate change may reduce their growth, their reproduction success, the survivorship of these fishes, and also alter the distribution in similar ways that they do in the surface. And that will impact the fish catch potential. Um, on the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere on a changing climate, showed this model that um, the changes in the maximum catch potential will be decreasing in severely in some of the areas while increased towards the poles. So this is something that we need to take into account when we are uh, doing management of um, the uses of the deep sea to be sure that the climate it's incorporated. So it's not just about how we use the deep sea in terms of fishing, extracting energy, extracting other raw materials, and uh, 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 um, using as a waste uh, uh, disposal, but we also need to think about uh, uh, the warming, the acidification, and the deoxygenation of the deep sea, and how it will have a cumulative effect on the other um, the other uses of the deep sea. Here I will show you um, two examples. This, we know that the, 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 the climate change can alter the currents. We also know that some species, they need the currents to transport the larvae from one place to the other in order to maintain the populations. So what will happen is that if climate change can alter the currents, potentially, and this is the study of how connected some of um, deep sea hydrothermal vents are, under the scenario of um, climate change will be some loss of transport of larvae. Some places will be isolated. There will be no more larvae that will really change between those populations. So this type of prediction and impacts need to be taken into account when we are doing management. Also, this is a, a, a work of uh, my colleague Telmu and co-authors that forecasted cumulative climate refugiate areas and the future environmental conditions uh, of six cold water corals and six deep water commercial important fishes. And as you can see here, that all the refugia are towers the north and some of the species will have really, really just localized areas as refugia. And refugia are habitats that some species can retreat to persist and expand from there when the changes uh, uh, happen. And they are potential safe shelter for those biota, especially those ones that are poor dispersed species. So we need to identify the impacts, warming, deoxygenation, acidification, alter of uh, food at the bottom of the ocean, use that information and couple climate and biological modeling approaches from general circulation models, larva dispersion, species distribution models, use that on the environmental management, on the strategic planning, special management, environmental impact assessments, precautionary approach, and account of that in all the extractions activities and apply to all deep ocean uses, the ones that we are, are already in place and future ones. So I care about the deep sea because it's part of our daily life. It gives the nutrients to phytoplankton that produces the oxygen that we breathe. It regulates the clima, the climate as we know today by absorbing the heat, by sequestrating carbon dioxide and by helping the thermal in circulation, our giant thermostat, and because it puts food in our tables. So deep sea is part of our life and we need to care about it. Thanks for your attention.
Thank you very much, Anna. Wonderful presentation. I would like to introduce the speaker now, Dr. Simi Payne. Dr. Simi is an Associate Professor of Law and Human Ecology at Rogers University and the Chair of the International Union for Conservation of Nature World Commission on Environmental Law Specialist Group on Ocean, Coasts and Coral Reefs. Dr. Simi obtained her Master's Degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and her Juris Doctor from the University of California, Berkeley. She advises the IUCN delegation to the BBMJ negotiation and she has appeared before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea on behalf of IUCN and as an expert before the International Court of Justice. Dr. Simi also just got her COVID vaccine like a few minutes ago. So thank you so much, so much Dr. Simi for being here with us today. Well, thank you to the organizers. I hope you can hear me through my mask. Is that okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to speak today about how climate solutions are integrated into international deep sea governance. And to start with, um, I'd like to say, oh, and next slide, please, that there are three key international climate change strategies. The most important is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The second is to increase resilience of the natural environment by reducing other impacts, especially shipping, fishing, and in the future, deep seabed mining. The third is various geoengineering techniques. Legal protections have been and will continue to be difficult to negotiate and to implement. We've been trying since 1992. The most effective tools are going to be those that reduce land-based emissions because that is the source of most greenhouse gases. This is uh, my, one of my favorite graphs that on the left shows emitters of greenhouse gases and on the right, the gases they emit. And you'll see that at the very top, I've outlined a small section in a red box. The global shipping fleet is estimated to account for two and a half percent of global carbon dioxide emissions. And although that's increasing with the growth of shipping, you can see that terrestrial activities are still gonna dominate and be the most important area for control. Greenhouse gases mix in the atmosphere, so it doesn't matter whether they're emitted on land or sea, they'll still drive warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. Next slide, please. So it may surprise you to hear that the Montreal Protocol, which was designed to protect the ozone hole, is currently our most effective tool because ozone depleting substances, it turns out, also cause warming. Next slide, please. But there was a catch. HFCs, chemical substitutes for CFCs that don't hurt the ozone are actually strong climate forcing gases. The Montreal Protocol's Kigali Amendment bans HFCs. So we're starting to address that problem. Next slide, please. Now, if we think about what we're doing on the ocean, the International Maritime Organization goal for ships is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from 2008 levels by 2050 not the most ambitious of the strategies that have been put out there. The central organization is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change from 1992, which generally provides institutional and legal framework for global greenhouse gas emission reductions. And the Paris Agreement, which is a subsidiary agreement to that. Next slide, please. The Paris Agreement is the newest tool to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's based on nationally determined contributions to mitigation that each country puts forward. These are called NDCs. The first NDCs were submitted in 2015. New NDCs are to be submitted, were to be submitted in 2020, but were delayed because of the pandemic. 
So they're being submitted this year by most countries and the United States will put one forward too, I'm happy to say. Now, in general, the ocean has not been the central focus of the international climate regime. But the ocean climate change dialogue last December really brought it to the fore. And we're starting to see more indices that include the ocean, particularly focused on renewable energy and reducing emissions related to ocean-based industries. Next slide, please. The really important strategy that we can focus on the ocean itself and the deep ocean is to increase its resilience by removing other insults to ocean life. Especially important for the deep ocean is to get a moratorium on deep seabed mining, which has not yet begun, but is anticipated to commence soon. Now the Paris Agreement can also include NDCs that address the ocean, protecting and restoring blue carbon ecosystems. Next slide, please. Under negotiation at the United Nations is the, a new treaty that seeks to conserve marine biodiversity and to ensure that its use is sustainable. It'll apply to the ocean beyond the national 200 nautical mile limit of the exclusive economic zone, which we call the high seas. It's about 40% of the earth's surface and it's where most of the deep ocean is found. The elements of that treaty, which would be especially relevant to climate change impacts on the deep ocean, would be environmental impact assessment which provides information about proposed activities that would affect marine biodiversity in the high seas, especially cumulative impacts, including those from climate change. The capacity building and tech transfer provisions and area-based management tools. And this slide shows an indication of some especially sensitive areas that might be candidates in the future for marine protected areas or other tools. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. The third strategy is the one demonstrated in this slide. Um, if mitigation fails, a number of scientists have proposed the possibility of geoengineering. This involves essentially two approaches. One, which is to store carbon under the seabed by either pumping it there or using something like phytoplankton or algae to sink the carbon that they embody to the seabed. Of course, having already heard from the previous speakers that ocean productivity is likely to be reduced, um, that may not be such a great solution because it may simply not work. The other strategy is to reflect solar radiation by cloud brightening or putting aerosols, probably sulfur, into the stratosphere where they would scatter some sunlight back to space. Unfortunately, the promoters of these technologies favor deploying them in the ocean beyond national jurisdiction. Once again, where they are likeliest to directly affect the deep ocean. So this is considered controversial and risky. I think it's a matter that would benefit from more attention and concern by governance experts. Finally, um, some places to watch for further developments include the resumption of the UN's negotiation of the new BB&J Treaty, which will be in August, and the next UN Climate Summit in November of 2021. Developments at the national level as countries implement an economic, stim economic stimulus packages to recover from COVID may also be opportunities for input on blue climate change measures. Last slide, please. And you have to go through a couple there. One more, please. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you uh, for your attention and 
look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Simi. Really, um, we appreciate that you were here, even though you were in a public space and it was still wonderful. We could hear you perfectly. And thank you so much to Laurent, Yoshihisa, Anna, and Simi again for your rich and thought-provoking presentations. I hope you all enjoyed them. And now we would like to introduce the, I would like to introduce, sorry about that, our moderators for the Q&A session, who are also the leads of the DOSI Climate Change Working Group. Our two moderators are Dr. Lisa Levin, Distinguished Professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego, and Dr. Moriaki Yasuhara, Associate Professor of Environmental Science in the School of Biological Sciences and the Swire Institute of Marine Science at the University of Hong Kong. Welcome, Lisa and Moriaki. I will let you take over. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate your introduction. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed great talk. Thank you for your uh, great talk, all the speakers. And also thank you for your uh, giving us many questions already. So far, we already have more than 10 questions. So let me start from a question. Uh, from uh, Laura Pantuzzi, and uh, she's talking about the, our understanding on the deep water circulation. So the question is, uh, what is the latest understanding of how the uh, deep water circulation known as AMOC will react to changes in heat content and, uh, and in the water cycle? So, any of you like to answer this question? Maybe Roland, Shira or Anna, anybody like? Yes, I, I can start if you want, Mariaki, thank you. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so, so for some years now, we know that climate change may or will impact uh, the intensity of the overturning circulation and especially uh, its uh, North Atlantic components. So, the intensity at which the surface waters will sink to the deep ocean and then will transport water masses to the south in the North Atlantic. The latest generation of uh, Earth system models um, just confirm what we knew already uh, with quite uh, significant reductions in this intensity over the next decades by maybe minus 30 to minus 50% uh, in terms of intensity for the end of the 21st century. Uh, so the, the, the processes are still the same than the one I was uh, describing before because the water is warmer and because it's also less saline because of the input of fresh water from the continents from melting ice. Uh, you have uh, a decreasing density at the surface and less formation of these deep waters. What's surprising in the new generation of models is the fact that this decrease seems to be quite insensitive to the emission scenarios. So we have almost the same decrease in the intensity of the amok in the high emission scenarios than in the like middle or high mitigation scenarios, uh, which will need some further uh, investigations in the next months and years. Thank you, Laura. Um, our next question is from Sarah Davis and maybe for uh, Shira or Anna, Will deep sea ecosystems directly under surface water subduction and downwelling zones be more impacted than other areas? And we have, uh, anybody wanna answer this? But you're, everybody's muted, so you'll have to unmute if anybody's trying to give us an answer. Anna or Shira? Okay, I will try to answer. The under the surface water subduction zone uh, is more impacted than other areas. I do not think so because it's very very rare places that these subduction of the surface water 
to the deep sea happens. Uh, of course, for example, in the areas close to Gibraltar Channel, the waters is sinking down, but it is not from the surface. But so I I do not think this is a, a very serious uh, areas where these subduction of surface waters goes to the deep sea for us. Of course, the uh, North Atlantic regions, the water is subducting, but as uh, the Laurent answers, that the subduction is also decreasing now. So I am a little bit less uh, positive for this. Uh, possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Sira. So let's see the next question is from Yerun uh, Arendt. And the question is, I was wondering how satellite remote sensing data, for example, sea surface temperature, ocean color, uh, dissolved organic matter, etc. Uh, which mostly take place at the sea surface, could be used in relation to uh, deep ocean observation. Uh, so is there any certain relationship between surface and deep? So maybe... Uh, yeah, Anna I think or... I can, yeah. uh, I sure. can say Please. that, yeah. Yeah, there are many, many papers that where the surface uh, re uh, primary production is high, the ecosystem in the deep sea is uh, rich. And also if the seasonal change of the primary production in the surface occurs, uh, and sometimes the uh, spring phytoplankton blooms will directly go to the deep sea for us. So there are uh, several or many papers which indicated the direct relationships between surface uh, 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 primary production and the deep sea uh, ecosystems. And also there, I'd like to emphasize one recent robot technology is called Argo that is measuring not only the surface, but also the deep sea midwater environment that is uh, making uh, a big change in the oceanography. So we are now understanding a three-dimensional structure of ocean much better than before. Thank you. I'm muted here. Um, we have a, a series of questions about uh, actually geoengineering. Um, Matthew Stace, Status asks, what are people's opinions of the potential uses of ocean alkalinity enhancement and iron fertilization technologies in the future to combat ocean acidification and climate change, respectively? Um, but we also had uh, questions from Mark Winslow about geoengineering looks to do clever things. None of, none of them. Um, with technical solutions, we barely scratch the surface and none of them can scale yet to the size we require to make a difference. Uh, and uh, let's see, there, there's a few others, anonymous. So I, I guess I would pose to uh, Simi and anyone else who would like to answer uh, about your opinions of the use of geoengineering to tackle climate change. Okay, why don't I start and um, then I think my science scientist colleagues can answer some of the others about anticipated effects. The ge geoengineering governance currently is chiefly in the hands of the scientists. And so far, uh, you may have seen the news that an experiment that a group at Harvard intended to do was actually postponed or canceled this week because of protests by Swedish indigenous peoples. You know, that's 
I think kind of the, where the state of the governance is right now, um, we don't have a really, we really don't have a governance regime though. And it's entirely possible that some private actors, some countries may decide to go forward with a research field tests and deployment of geoengineering technologies, which is a real matter of concern. Uh, you may know that Australia tried some of these techniques in a way to uh, protect its coral reefs. So it's an area where we need a lot more attention. We probably do need to have more integration of uh, the inf scientific information about the biological and physical impacts in the deep ocean with the technological developments. I will say one of my colleagues at Rutgers, Alan Robach, has long been um, negative about geoengineering technology, but he is engaged in computer-based modeling of the potential effects of it, because in his view, it's something that simply may go forward and it's better to be thinking about it and preparing for it in case we need it. Thank you. Um, Anna or anyone else? Anna, would you like to give your thoughts? Yeah, I was trying to put my video on, but it does not want. Yes, uh, um, we have been talking on those climate change about these um, geoengineering solutions that are starting to appear. And there are several ones, and um, uh, some of them might be really interesting, but we need to understand uh, the potential impacts, positive or negative, towards the deep sea. This iron fertilization is something that in the, in the early 90s, um, uh, several people talked about uh, if the iron fertilization could help to, to, um, to mitigate the climate change. But the impacts in the bottom of the ocean are special because it will increase um, the biomass that will um, uh, arrive to the bottom of the ocean is something that we need to try to understand. Also, the, the alkali we talk about the acidification of the oceans and the geoengineering, it's the alkalinization um, to neutralize this acidification. So we need to understand if the immediate impact um, on the organisms that we do not know, there is just barely uh, some anecdotal studies about that. And, the potential of the upper scaling debt. So it's something that uh, it might be really interesting, but at the same time, we need to uh, try to understand better what will be the potential effects of that in the environment. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on this before we move to the next question? Maybe Lisa, if I may, just one or two comments on those geoengineering options. So I would say that when you compare iron fertilization and alkalinity enhancement, there are at two very different stages in terms of both understanding and testing. Um, iron fertilization, we know from modeling studies that it's not efficient in mitigating climate change. Even if we fertilize the entire ocean, uh, adding a lot of iron, uh, the total effect we could gain on atmospheric CO2 is quite limited, just a few PPMs, tens of PPMs, uh, with lots of... Uh, these benefits, lots of lateral consequences. We know that if you add iron somewhere in the ocean, you will probably lack the other nutrients somewhere else. So you may even trigger decreased phytoplankton production in some other regions. Uh, so lots of uh, negative consequences. In terms of alkalinity enhancements, we don't have large scale uh, experiments. Uh, we don't have even uh, experiments in the field uh, apart from some very, very small scale ones on the coastal zone. Uh, we know that contrary to ocean uh, iron fertilization, there is no theoretical limit, but there may be lots of potential uh, effects on the biota, uh, because when you add alkaline material, you also add trace metals with potential detrimental effects. And there may be also lots of technological issues. Uh, you need to mine huge quantities of alkaline material, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of questions, yes. Okay, thanks. Maybe we'll move on and let Moriaki handle the next question. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, there is a question about the regional differences in the behaviors. For example, in the 
Western Mediterranean Sea uh, in the future because of maybe increased ventilation and deep sea oxygen may increase. So could we observe different, this kind of regional differences in uh, climatic behavior or we can project something like this in the future? Maybe Laurent and Anna have some opinion about this regional perspective. Yes, uh, so in my sh very short presentation, I mostly focused on the, on the average, uh, global average change of both acidification, deoxygenation and warming. But we have in the model we use uh, uh, a huge heterogeneity between the different regions. That's well illustrated, for example, with deoxygenation. So you have places, deep ocean regions that will deoxygenate, that will lose oxygen much more than some other regions. And for example, in the tropical regions, the models don't agree even in the sign of these oxygen uh, future trends with some models indicating increased oxygen concentrations, some other models indicating decreased oxygen concentrations. And you have to know that, in fact, you have for oxygen, especially some, some compensating mechanisms that go in both directions. Because the water is warmer, it basically uh, holds less oxygen uh, but at the same time, because you decrease productivity at the surface, you have less organic matter sinking down, and so less use of oxygen in the deep ocean. And those two processes, they may compensate each other, so that you may have in some places deoxygenation, and some in some other places maybe more oxygen in the coming decades. So it's, it's a complicated system, and of course we need to, to do more. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Interaction between different parameters like oxygen, temperature, productivity is really important. So we still have a time for... Yeah, I, I think what, what, what we're gonna tell people is that if you need to go, please do, but we will continue to answer questions for a few more minutes um, as long as the panelists are able to stay with us. Um, so I, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, uh, here's one. Um, will shorter term increases in net primary productivity due to warming until optimum is exceeded mask aspects of the longer term decline? Is this possibly manifested as a temporary increase of upwelling in selected areas? If so, does this relate to any historical or geological evidence of increased settlement of organic carbon and upwelling during periods, however temporary, of higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? We can open this up to any of our panelists or even to Moriaki, who's got the geological expertise. Yes, I, I can have a try also on upwelling regions. It's also uh, quite controversial. Um, there is this famous hypothesis, which is named the Bakun hypothesis, uh, which stipulates that with warming, the continent warms more than the ocean. So you have an increased temperature gradient. And so increased coastal winds, more upwelling and more productivity in the coastal system as uh, in responding to anthropogenic climate change. Uh, and we have some observations over the past uh, decades, probably in, in the Californian uh, coastal upwelling system, but maybe in some other coastal upwelling systems. And this contrasts with some of the result of future projections uh, that show some decreased productivity in some of these upwelling regions. The consensus now is that uh, we would probably see a migration uh, towards the pole. So in the north, in the northern hemisphere and towards the south in the southern uh, hemisphere operating systems of the center of those operating systems. So maybe increased upwelling poleward and decreased upwelling uh, equatorward uh, with uh, responses of productivity that would go along. So maybe decreased productivity equatorward of the operating systems and increased productivity poleward of the of the systems. In addition to that, you have natural variability, 
like multi-decadal viability uh, that somehow adds onto those long-term trends due to climate change and it's a difficult question yes okay thank you moraki you want to take the next question sure yeah uh, let me see So a question about the abyssopelagic zone is still really understudied uh, system, a kind of black box. And uh, how the question is how can forecasting of the impact of climatic change be improved to better understand the time scale of response of deep water mass in abyssopelagic zone, I think. Anybody like to say about this? Maybe Anna or Shira? I think our understanding on the deep sea ecosystem is pretty much based on benthic organisms and uh, yeah, as Elba said, our understanding on abyssopelagic system and climatic impact is pretty much understudied, and we may not know much about that yet. But I myself is not really working on pelagic deep seas, so somebody say something yeah. about this? Yeah, I think the Moriaki's comment is right, yeah. We know better for the basic uh, ecosystem compared to the abyssopelagic zones. But uh, recently, there are a lot of the new technologies uh, applicable for the observation of the abyssopelagic zones. For example, the autonomous underwater vehicle is rapidly developing. So in the future, uh, we may have a dig up uh, uh, making uh, the gaps much smaller than now. Uh, for example, the seabed uh, 2030 project is trying to observe only the sea for us, but probably they also have an information on the abyssopelic zones too. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank I, you, Sia. Yeah, I just want to add that the, the few, um, there, there have been some studies about metabological aspects on um, deep sea pelagic fishes. And uh, um, some of the studies show that they are quite sensitive on um, changes in, in temperature or, uh, or acidity and that the metabological aspects Will be will slow down or some aspects will be shut down. So it's true that we know just for a few species and it's an adoptal in or uh, taking into account the high diversity that exists in the pelagic environment. But um, the um, what we have been uh, what is being published is that uh, it's few, but it already shows that uh, some um, some impacts will will be uh, 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 they will suffer from the uh, increased temperature or decrease in pH. Okay, thank you. I, I we have a question for, which I think also is for Anna uh, from Nicholas Moiti. Uh, could you expand a bit more in the role of deep and very deep ocean as climate change refugia? How much sea surface temperature increase really affects deeper water? For Anna, is it you? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Yes, um, I cannot give a straight answer there. I think it depends on the, um, the species and what we know about the species distribution. It's a uh, species related. If you if you see the the all the works that is are being done 
considering the climate refugia. Climate refugia is just it's not just based in um, in temperature. It's based on the uh, how the species are distributed, how the currents are, how the amount of food arrives uh, to them. So it's all that together that will make um, the, with the modeling say that these areas will be a refugia. It will be a good shelter for them to survive. So it's not just about um, sea surface temperature increase. It's about uh, all the aspects together. Yeah, by a bit following up, Anna, and deep water temperature can be pretty much depending on how deep uh, they are. If it's relatively shallow, like uh, less than 1,000 meter, it may be more related to sea surface temperature change. But if it's really, really deep, like uh, 3,000, 4,000 or deeper, it may be more related to deep water circulation or overturning circulation. So cold water can sink from the surface to the bottom from polar North Atlantic Ocean coming south to Antarctica and going to Indian Pacific Ocean. Such kind of circulation may be more controlling the temperature in really deep sea. And also, but also historically speaking, we have quite similar behavior between sea surface temperature and also deep water temperature in like a decadal scale or a centennial scale or longer. So we may not know the exact mechanism, but we still see the similar tendency in changes in sea surface temperature and deep water temperature in general, in my opinion. And let me take a bit related, but a bit different question. Uh, what implication will AMOC, uh, overturning circulation shutdown, uh, have in regard to the oxygen content in the world ocean? So what happened if AMOC stopped in regard with oxygen content? Yeah, maybe I can bring one element. So uh, the fact that the ocean is losing oxygen today is due to two major drivers. Uh, the first one is, is uh, warming. So because a warmer water mass uh, will have less, will be uh, less soluble for uh, the oxygen gas. So just because the ocean is warming, it loses oxygen. And then the other big driver of ocean uh, deoxygenation is linked to decreased ventilation, decreased formation of deep water masses, and uh, increased uh, stratification of the ocean. The surface of the ocean is, is uh, very oxygenated. And so if you, increased, if you increase stratification, if you reduce ventilation, you will have less oxygen uh, ventilated to the subsurface and to the deep ocean. So clearly, in the North Atlantic, there is a strong link between uh, the amok shutdown or slowdown and decreasing oxygen levels uh, in the deep. Uh, that's absolutely true. Thank you. Okay, um, the next, well, we have a couple of questions for Simi um, that relate to governance from, and I'm just gonna ask them both because I think we probably wanna try to begin to wrap up. Um, um, Simi, one is uh, from Pardeep Singh, it's probable that deep seabed mining would be, uh, would fuel, very fuel and energy intensive in terms of mining in areas beyond national jurisdiction. How do greenhouse gas emissions, um, how would they be regulated and who should do this? Um, to the sponsoring state, would the Paris Agreement apply and do we treat greenhouse gas emissions from the on-site mining component and the transportation component separately? And then we have a, a question from Gurkan Kapar. Under the current circumstances, what can we uh, can we use international environmental law to address problems coming with ignoring the effects of climate change to the deep ocean? Is the UNFCCC regime, particularly with its new form after the Paris Agreement, 
capable of addressing these problems and do we need a new deep sea protection regime or is it better to attach these problems to climate change governance, which has its own problems? You're muted, Simi. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> the Thank you for both questions. They're both um, difficult ones. And uh, Pradeep Singh is probably as uh, well able to answer his question as I am. So we'll, be, we'll have an interesting conversation. Um, I think, so the question about how emissions are attributed when they occur in the high seas in this area that's beyond the national territory of any country is a vexed one. And it's the reason that the emissions from uh, the air, air, airplanes, aviation, um, as well as international shipping have been dealt with outside of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in the past in terms of reporting and setting targets. Um, it, I, I do think that that whole question might be best dealt with by its own uh, protocol, something that would really look at the real uh, controllers and interests in the activities, uh, because there's financial interests, there's the ship owners, there's, it's complicated regime. Um, and so the allocation of responsibility is not clear in my view um, and, and should be clarified so that we don't miss out those emissions and really have a way to control them. I'm sorry, the second question was about, if I understood correctly, um, do we need a special regime to that seeks to protect the deep ocean? Is that is that right, Lisa? Uh, yes, I think. a paraphrase. Yeah, I think. Or the, it's climate aspects of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, a better integration of the agreements that we already have would make sense. We have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change with the gaps that I just described, um, but that is really the place that we have some leverage, we have an institutional framework to work on emission, greenhouse gas emissions. And with respect to the adaptation responses, there's a number of places that that can be done um, through the new agreement that's being negotiated that I mentioned through very strict governance of any activity like deep seabed mining, which has its own regulatory regime through the 1994 agreement and the International Seabed Authority. Um, but there's still always possibilities of new activities that we need to address. So uh, I wouldn't say that there's no, no need for uh, more, more agreements to deal with more activities. Thank you both, Lisa and Mariaki, for um, moderating the, the Q&A. And thank you so much for the, to the panelists for answering the questions. So on behalf of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, I would like to thank you for joining us today. We really hope you have enjoyed this webinar. And I would like to um, wish you a, a great rest of your day. And if you're somewhere in the world where the sun has set, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>